Good evening, everybody, and welcome to FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. I am David Carrico, and I am here tonight with my co-host, Brian Reese, and we're so honored to be able to present to you Episode 2 of the Cities Lost in Time series, Karnak, Temple of the Long Skulls. Tonight, you're in for an amazing ride back in time to see not only the explanation for some of the ancient mysteries we see upon this earth, and most importantly, a biblical explanation and clarification of those things. And once again, we are here saying the answer to all the questions and ancient mysteries are in the Word of God. And we're going to lift up the Word of the Lord and see that that's just the case tonight. And Brian, I'm so excited to be here on episode two. Welcome to the broadcast, my friend. Thanks for having me, David. It's always a pleasure being on here with everybody here in the chat tonight. And the city's lost in time, Karnak Temple, the Long Skulls. The last one we did was Chichen Itza. You know, we did the uh, talk about Quasi Qualto, Cole Calkin, and all those characters. Now we're going to be going and talking about the elongated skulls and the connection with all that with Karnak. It's going to be interesting, folks. So hang on to your seats, and I'm just glad to be part of it. Well, I am too. And we have a tremendous amount of material to present tonight. So let's get to work. And we're going to begin by showing uh, a map here so that everyone can have an understanding of just where we're talking about. You can see here uh, the city of Karnak and Karnak and Luxor. They were just basically in the same proximity. And we're going to be showing this evening the uh, road of the sphinxes. That There was a row of sphinxes that connected Karnak and Luxor. And we're going to be bringing in the significance of that as we show you the ancient festival of Ophet, the ancient sacred marriage that took place there. But way back in the 70s, I read a book entitled In Search of Ancient Mysteries, and my love for the ancient mysteries and the ancient megalithic structures. I read Eric von Donneken's book, Chariot of the Gods. I think that was about uh, 1968 or 69. And in the 70s, I read a lot of books like this one here in Search of the Ancient Mysteries. And very early, I was converted uh, in uh, the beginning of the 70s. And I began to apply the word of God to give understanding to these mysteries, but I want to read just a little bit of this in search of ancient mysteries to just set the stage of the magnificence that we're going to be looking at. Uh, it says there's the chapter 11 is the heretic at Karnak. It says 33 centuries ago at Karnak on the east bank of the Nile, an extraordinary temple arose. It became the largest religious building in the world and was never exceeded by any built later. We're looking at the biggest temple ever built in the history of mankind this evening. It goes on to say the hall's monolithic pillars stood like a giant tree trunks in a forest. A number of them were 33 feet in girth. Now, why would they be 33 feet, Brian? And we're going to see as we go into this temple some amazing uh, numerology and the structures that is telling the story from the fallen angel perspective. It says a number of them were 33 feet in girth, so wide that a dozen men could have been hidden by one and were 69 feet high. They were crowned by spreading capitals of such size that 100 men could stand on one. The rest were 43 feet high. Within the walls, there could be room for St. Peter's in Rome, the Milan Cathedral, and Notre Dame in Paris. We're talking about something that is truly gigantic in size. And one of the characters that is tied to Karnak gives us the real significance and uh, the understanding of it, but is Akhenaten. And we're going to be looking at Akhenaten 
and his family, Nefertiti and his daughter. And I'll read here on page 125. This chapter is entitled The Heretic at Karnak. And Akhenaten declared all creeds but his own illegal and commanded once more that all the old temples should be closed and a substitute built at Karnak, the great open court temple to Aton, surrounded by 27 more than life-size statues of himself. So when Akhenaten showed up, he declared all the other worship of all other Egyptian gods illegal. He set up at Karnak the temple to Aten. And we're going to have Brian. He is going to take us here right down to the temple at Karnak with Google Earth, and we're going to be seeing this firsthand, and we're going to be some see some amazing things that we're going to try to explain to you as we go. But Brian, take us away. Take us right to Karnak. All right, folks. As you can see, we have Karnak. So I want to point some things out here for everybody to see. So I'm a big I'm a big fan of looking at megalithic sites and megalithic cities and metropolises of ancient of ancient days. And Karnak is one of those folks that really gets my attention. So the first thing that comes to my mind when I when I look at the aerial view of this, Brother David and everybody in the chat, is I see an aerial view and I look at it and I look at it through a different pair of eyes, literally, and I see it almost resembles of a modern day, like a large scale motherboard on a computer. Okay, so hear me out, folks. I know it. It uh, it's a little bit wide spectrum here, but yeah, when you look at it, it looks like a large scale motherboard, CPU, GPU. I used to build little computers. I know kind of the basics of it. So a large scale motherboard on computers. So what was going on here? Like Brother Dave was talking about the, you know, we're talking about the Karnak and talking about is there a fallen angel? Is there something here? Numerology, is there something here that the Egyptians knew, the Karnak people, the elongated head people, these ancient people, Nephilim, was there some type of connection tied to this? From They had to have an aerial perspective to pull off such precision and complexity in this endeavor. So let's get into it real quick. So the first one on the list, the Avenue of the Rams is what it is uh, spoken of on Google Earth, but it is the Avenue of the Sphinx. I'm going to draw y'all's attention to the walkway. Today, I counted these in my research. I was reviewing everything. On the left side, there is literally 20 sphinxes, okay? And there's 20 sphinxes on the right. When you're walking up the path and walking down and observing, before you even get to the uh, fortress of the Karnak or the facility here, I started looking and I was uh, pondering on it. I looked to the left, I looked to the right. You got one, two, three, four, these impressions into the uh, fortress of Karnak. And then also on the right, you got one, two, three, four. So there's four and four. There's 20 and 20. Wait, there's more folks. So four, 20, four, 20. If I was a fallen entity and I was teaching mankind and manipulating things to a certain degree, and building these facilities on the face of the earth, what would I do? How would I pull this off? Because I have seen things that are of the heavenly realm, right? If I was of the fallen entities, the fallen angelic realm of things. And they was teaching people uh, the ancient technology. So when I look at this, folks, I see this ancient motherboard. It almost looks like a large scale, small, you know, like a small scale computer with CPUs, etc. So wait. I'll make the connection real quick where I'm getting at with the 420. So you have 420 on the left, you got 420 on the right, you get these sphinxes, right? These rams. So later on in the program, we're going to be talking about this green space here. It's water. Okay, so it's the sacred lake of Karnak. So if you as you can see on the right hand of this of the lake here, well and behold, I'll show you the min, the dimensions here. I couldn't believe the length of Karnak the sacred lake, it's approximately 420 feet. So I said, is there some type of synchronization here? Is there something here that is just so compelling to, I needed to bring this up into the program here at Cities Lost in Time. I thought it was so fitting 
what was going on in Karnak? So the first thing I think of too, water cooling. What would you have to do if you had a large scale, if you had a small scale computer with water cooling, you have to cool your CPU so your computer can run properly. You have to keep the CPU, the GPU down to a lower temp to maintain your programs, your software, all that good stuff and the hardware itself to make sure the computer doesn't overheat and actually collapse. So it's interesting. There's a sacred lake that has the dimensions. The length is 420. And then when you go to the, before you even hit Karnak, there's this 420. 420. What do you say, Brother David? What's going on here? What what what's going on here? What do you think, David? Well, the answer is in the word of God. And the answer is an understanding that it was the Nephilim, that will be our contention this evening, that it was the Nephilim, which are, according to Genesis 6, when the fallen angels mated with human women, they brought forth the giants of old. And we're going to be showing that the things that were built here at Karnak, they had some help. They had some help. And it wasn't, as our ancient aliens friends say, from uh, E.T. or Space Brothers, but it was from these mighty men of old, the giants. Now, everything in understanding what Satan does is he imitates what the things of the Lord are very specifically he does we talked about how at atlantis they even put an imitation of the throne of god there in atlantis in the original story of plato but we see here we've got 24 and 24 and we're coming in to the temple and we're going to be we go into this hypo style hall and it's amazing we're going to be showing you some close-ups of that but pull back brian and i want to show here there's a uh, right here, there's an obelisk of Hatsaput, and we're going to be showing how the tradition of Hatsaput, what, that she was conceived by a union between a human woman and a god. Also, that is the same theory behind Akhenaten and the belief that he was the product of a divine union. We're going to be showing you the temple of the, the ritual of Ophet, which was that ritual of the divine marriage. Everything here speaks of the Genesis 6 scenario, the sons of God and daughters of men. And how about the dual 24s? And how about the 420 on the measurements of the sacred lake? Nothing here is coincidental. And in Revelation chapter 4 and 4, it says, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crown of gold. Now that's what it is before the real throne of God, the twenty-four elders. Now the fallen ones had been there and done that. They knew what the throne of God looked like. They knew about the twenty-four, and God judged them and mm. cast them down and put them in change for lying uh, with human women. So coincident? Absolutely not. Everything here is speaking to the satanic ambition of creating a temple whereby they can enter back in to the throne of God without obedience to the true God. And there's another 24. There's a 24 in the Old Testament and a 24 in the New that speak of coming into the presence of God in Exodus chapter 24. And I've long ago gave up believing in coincidence. But in verse 9, it says, Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. So we got two 24s. In the Bible, one of the old, one of the new, and I think this is absolutely significant. Uh, I agree a hundred, hundred percent, brother David. You know, you're talking about the ceremony and everything here, and going up to the obelisk, right? So you're having these ram, you're going through the front gate, and then you're reaching the phallic. Just you know, it's so it's so occultic, right? It's just, and then you have the the uh, uh, hypo style hall. If you look at the, the hypostolic hall, folks, that alone, the pillars are so gigantic. And the the artwork that has been put on those pillars is nothing but 
the complexity and the endeavor of it and whoever was whoever did that had superior i'm gonna zoom in on it for they had superior knowledge of something of ancient and there's uh, a lot of these yeah. images are blurred look out at those. look how I mean, look at that look I mean, at the height of the people mm -hmm. i mean we're talking massive a uh, massive endeavor and that i mean they're they're gigantic and i haven't even had a chance to count them all there's so many but look at this average size you know five eleven six foot tall man and you can see the pillars and this this place is gigantic karnak is an endeavor i mean it's just a marvelous place to i wouldn't probably i'd like to probably go but in this day and time you know i don't know i'm just not going to travel that far out but for if i ever had the opportunity it'd be it would be a blessing but uh but yeah it's a very interesting place brother david very interesting see you can see there it is they are, there's the obelisk you're coming from this point of point of entry there's where the rams that's where the sphinx are you're coming in you know we mentioned the 420 they're coming in down this walkway you're going through these halls these hop the hypo style halls that have all this egyptian uh hieroglyphics all up and down they're all intricately uh you know built together they're all got different they all each one has different languages only not different languages but different translations of egyptian on it and i wonder i wonder how many they've if they've actually even translated them all they probably have but it's just so interesting going through there it's just this is a very very huge tourist site and one would wonder what's really going on here you know you got the sacred the sacred lake not too far when you look you zoom out here and then you got the uh, the obelisk here, the sacred, uh, the sacred lake is literally just in walking distance. And if you look, a lot of people would say, well, uh, Brian, uh, you know, where there's, where there's water, there's food, where there's food, there's water, where there's water, there's people. I get that. But this facility, if you look at all the structures that mankind that has to have water cooling systems, okay, uh, few nuclear fusion, we're talking CERN, we're talking these hydrogen colliders, they have to have certain things above ground and in the below scenario to pull off the systems that they use in 2023. So I'm saying that this ancient technology is probably even superior to what we have today, absolutely, but we cannot replicate and understand it to the uh to the degree that they did back then. Mm -hmm. Well, and for those that think, well, this is just um, crazy crackers, we're going to be showing you undeniable evidence that there were modern machines used. Well, I won't say modern machines. They wouldn't be modern machines, but they were machines that were as sophisticated or more sophisticated than any modern machinery we have. We're going to be showing you proof of that. So, you know, don't dismiss that out of hand before you give a listen and take a look at the evidence for yourself. Absolutely, David. There's there's a view of the Hapa Shoot obelisk there on the ground view there, folks. So we're, you know, we're past the hall, the hypo style hall, and there's something to do with that too I could bring up and just comment on the the obelisk, there's something, they're harnessing the energies from the heavens, and that's how they was able to pull off the, let's just face it, with harmonetic, harmoni uh, what's the term, there's um, har uh, harmonics, well, harmonization, I think it's how you say it, harmonization, har har uh, harmonics, the sound waves, frequency waves, they're pulling stuff from the airways and, and using this facility thousands and thousands of years ago in Karnak. Mm -hmm. And it in the, um, uh, also, the, you mentioned it looking like a computer board. Mm -hmm. In obelisks, there are granite crystals and quartz crystals, and it's the quartz crystals in a computer that allows it to be able to store memory. And literally, the obelisks, we don't know all for sure what they were used for, but they would have been capable of being used as a communication device, something that would produce energy, store knowledge, or even perhaps weaponry. So mm -hmm. this is not at all beyond the realm of possibility. And there's just so much there that uh, really is pointing us to really seriously consider what was really going on here at Karnak. Now we'll go on to our next slide here. And this is called the Stele of Akhenaten. And what we see here is the whole family. And the legend behind Akhenaten is that he was brought forth from a union 
of uh, uh, a supernatural entity and a human woman, just like the Genesis 6 scenario. And here you see that Akhenaten, that Queen Nefertiti, and all the children are pictured with elongated skulls. All of them, the whole family. And everything here uh, gives us to, to believe that indeed uh, this was a Nephilim family. Yeah, and, you know, people will just discredit and say, hey, the hats, they just had bigger hats. The hats was just there for superior superior authority. They just, you know, social, you know, the, as far mm. as the celebrity status of Egypt, even Karnak times, right? The, the hat was there to symbolize authority. I'm not buying it. The hat was there to protect, keep their image down to say, hey, I'm just an ordinary person, but they couldn't get past the height. The tallness, right? We're you know the eight foot or however tall they was, right? So the the skull would fill up the whole hat. <laughs> you know, people just yeah. don't believe people don't believe that. But that's yeah, yeah. That is just really silly. They're asking us to believe a lot. They're just reaching to try to justify uh, their own theories and to debunk uh, the possibility of what the Bible's saying possibly actually being true, which it, which it absolutely is. And there's a book here, uh, The Enigma of Cranial Deformation, and this was written by David Hatcher Childress and, and Brian Forster. And I'm going to hold something up here on page 160. And this is just further proof. These are basalt statuettes of Maritatan, the daughter of of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And I mean, some of these, uh, she looks very reptilian. And I'll I'll just try to hold this up and hopefully maybe uh, you can get a look at that. But you, it's just very obvious that, uh, is that pretty? That's perfect, David. But you can see there that she was pictured with an extremely elongated skull. And like in the stele of Akhenaten, she was that way from youth. This wasn't something uh, we're not talking about headbanding. We're aware of headbanding. And the headbanding, that arose basically, I believe, as a tradition that uh, when these long skulls went away, they wanted to imitate them. And they wanted to form their children in imitation of worship of these entities that had been there. So we have tremendous evidence here that absolutely uh, this was a Nephilim family here. Now, in this next slide, we go all the way back to Samaria and we see actual slides of Sumerian clay figurines with elongated skulls. And they also, as some of these Egyptians do, they look pretty reptilian to my look here. Yeah, I think if somebody put took the time, David, to uh, you just mold these by their hand, they're replicating, they're rendering what they see. They're not, you know, they're not being confused. They're seeing it, and they're using such whatever pottery skills they have to pull it off. I mean, yeah, it's it's basically well we do the same thing today if we see something on an artistic standpoint you're looking at it you're wanting to capture it even if you don't have a you know if you don't have a cell phone you know camera you're wanting to capture it and write you know draw what your mind has seen mm -hmm. and you can tell the difference um there are suture marks on the human skull and you can tell that we're going to be showing some of these elongated skulls from peru that there's no suture marks you know, this is not something uh, that uh, is human. It is something non-human, and it's just a, it's just a verifiable, verifiable fact. And we're going to continue. We're going to show some uh, elongated skulls of very young children, and some even claim that some of these were even fetuses or even young children. But uh, let's just go ahead and let's just take a look at those. And we're going to be referencing uh, some of the other further work of Brian Forrester uh, in a work he did called Be Beyond the Black Sea, where he produces actual uh, that there actually been found these very young, uh, possibly even fetal children with elongated skulls. They were being born that way. Yeah, the uh, suture marks, a lot of people miss that. And then, you know, 
they still do the head ba- binding, right? The head ba- uh, banding yeah. to present and try to present these people. You know, they want their children to be godlike. And they're trying to replicate, once again, but they're using horrific, barbaric ways to render what they've seen, right? They're wanting to see the Gilberim, supposedly, again, the Nephilim or whatever. They're wanting to come, you know, and say, hey, yeah. my child is, they must be a, you know, super superhuman, so to speak. So give them golden jewelry, right? So that's what that's the way I interpret it, David. Mm-hmm. Well, absolutely, yeah. They were They were wanting to, they thought, well, if our children, we can ban their heads and make them look like, uh, these powerful Nephilim, well, our children will be honored and uh, and powerful in their society. And also, Brian, why don't you just take the, our, our listeners here through? There's some more um, slides here of these elongated skulls from Peru. We had them in Samaria. Got them all over. So just uh, go ahead and uh, take our listeners through this little tour of elongated skulls. Um Here's a rendering from the Brian uh, book, too, also, just an image, a drawing of it, uh, the rendering of the small children. Uh, elongated skulls, right, folks? So a lot of people uh, scoff at this and say it doesn't happen, it's never happened, and whatnot. But you know what's so interesting? The elongated skull narrative is in the, our neck of the woods, me and Brother David's in Oh, yeah. East Coast of America. So how'd they get there, right? So how is it all just isolated how they all pull them from Peru? But, you know, lo and behold, on, on the Ojai Valley, they're just, they're not there. They're miraculously just vanished, but you're putting them on display from Peru and whatnot, these other these other countries. Um, this picture here just shows a like a 3D rendering at the very bottom. It kind of shows the scale and the bust of what a man would have looked like with that type of skull. Um it shows a very good, as far as the sutras, you would be able to see, because that's not how our brains, our skulls are made in you know, as far as humans today. So um, we just wanted to make sure that everybody got a, got a feel for uh, Anunnakian uh, connection and everything for the Egyptian standpoint. And yeah, folks, I mean, we're talking about something here. This is when the, you know, we're talking about UFOs. They're bringing all that back. That's big into the media now. But then when you're looking at this, it's like, how can you discredit this? But then they'll say, well, they're different now or this or that. There's always some type of make-believe story out there. But this is absolutely evidence. So I have this other thing, David. I'm going to throw this out here to you, my friend. I hear, I've read in a lot of different uh, material, what could they have done and what kind of accomplishment could they have pulled at Karnak to be able to the Nephilim, let's just say the Nephilim, what if they've been able to shrink their skulls down to look, because we're talking about reptilians, we're talking about the elongated skulls, what if they was able to change their appearance to look like a human in 2020s, the 2023s, and and be able to have a superior authority, intellect, all kinds of knowledge, speak 15 different languages, could that be a possibility, David? That's a theory of mine. What do you think? Well, it could be, and that's what they were indeed trying to do. Uh, they were wanting to uh, present themselves to mankind as gods, and in ancient mythology and pagan religions, they did worship them as gods. We can see the worship of the Elohim right in the Word of God. And uh, even with all their effort, uh, they still come out looking a little bit weird. So, you know, they were doing the best they could uh but uh, still, they're very, very identifiable as the fallen ones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just interesting to me. They even in Peru, they find the red-headed, the red hair. So the red hair yeah. is found in a, in Kentucky, in the you know Kentucky area in Ohio Valley. The red-haired giants, right? So it's like almost so. The comparisons are off the hook. You can't. The similarities. There's nothing. It's it's undeniable. You can't get past it. There's been something here of an ancient time. There's Egyptian there's Egyptian hieroglyphics here in, in my neck of the woods in Kentucky, right? So there's no, there's something we've missed. You know, Karnak, the Temple of the Long Skull, is a program to actually expose the things that have been hidden. And that's, that's I'm so glad we're doing it, David. Yeah. Let's take a look here at our slide nine. We're going to ask you all a question. In uh, slide number nine, is there evidence 
that the builders of Karnak could have had help from the fallen angels and the Nephilim? Well, let us present to you Exhibit A. Now, this next slide is literally a slide of what they call the helicopter of Karnak. Now, look at this and just look at that right here in front of your eyes from the ancient temple of Karnak, thousands and thousands of years old. You know, that it ain't like, well, that might be a helicopter. That's a helicopter. Look at that. I mean, it's plain as day right before our eyes, Brian. Yeah, another thing I want to point out too, David, not only is there a Apache helicopter, it looks like a military helicopter. But not only that, on the right side of this slide here, there's like, it looks like a Venama. It looks like a spacecraft or something yeah. to that effect, right? And then yeah. the one above the spacecraft looks like a hovering car. There's yeah. so much, there's so many similarities there in comparisons to what we have in modern day times. So what was they doing in Karnak, uh, Brother David? Was they looking through some type of uh, looking glass project, something manipulation of, you know, the fallen angels knew the knowledge. In the book of Enoch, it talks about, you know, they, they taught uh, men how to, you know, to do forging, metalwork, and all these different things. Obviously, they could have pulled the Endeavor off, but it's just so interesting that the comparison to this and so similar, and how in the world somebody chiseling this out and, you know, taking a chisel and chiseling it into this into this granite here and saying, hey, there's an Apache helicopter. It'll, it'll show up in the, you know, the 20th century. You know, it, it just baffles the mind to me. Well, we have half animal, half human, all kind of weird creatures depicted. But the absolute truth of it is not that these people at Karnak were less intelligent or less technologically advanced. The truth is that in just in recent times, are we being able to c catch up with what they did? And much of what we do, it is admitted uh, by many scientists that they actually went back to develop a lot of their sophisticated technology, especially in Germany, right back to the Vedic texts. And this is something that uh, the people that develop these things are aware of. But I mean, a picture's worth a thousand words. And there's undeniably there uh, not only a helicopter, but other types of uh, very sophisticated boats or flying machines. There's no doubt about it. Now, let's go down to the next slide. As they always say, there's more. Now, this also from the temple at Karnak. This is a statue of Pharaoh Ramesses and child. Now, note here the child in proportion to Ramesses. You know, he is depicted not only as the statue huge, but it is meant to portray him as a very, very large individual. Now, I'm going to tell you something about uh, this statue here of Ramesses. This is from a book called Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. And it's written by an engineer by the name of Christopher Dunn. And on page 333, he writes this about this um, statue here of Karnak. He says, the telltale marks on a Ramesses head at Karnak and the indentation above the eyebrow suggest that a rectangular tool was directed along a precise path while oscillating at high frequency like a jackhammer against the surface. When the tool came to the eyebrow, it paused briefly, but the oscillations did not cease and the tool cut deeper where it rested. Such signs and signatures of machining are well-known consequences of allowing a tool to rest along its path while the cutting force is applied. The accidental grooves found in the statue of Amun and Mutt in the Luxor Museum are proof of tools that do not exist in the archaeological record. Wow. <laughs> wow and this 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 is goes back thousands of years and you know when they're talking about yeah. uh, the technology they have now what you just spoke of just then would i mean i don't understand why you know congress and the governments of this world are holding everything back but you pretty much just threw the mic down you can 
that's why they're doing it because they're using it for nefarious uh this technology for nefarious ways yeah it's interesting well, we've got Karnak set up like a computer board we got a lake to cool it we got the the obelisk there that was uh of Hatasaput, who was the legend of her and her story conceived of a union between a human woman and a god well we've got it all there we have the picture right there of modern modern flying machines helicopters boats mm -hmm. planes it's right there we've got the the obelisks that were capable of this energy transmission we have proof there's proof on the statue of Ramesses and others. They use tools on them, mm -hmm. high tech grinding tools. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the the facts are just not. It's just not a wild idea, but it's absolutely. Uh, they absolutely had technology that was equal to, and I, I guarantee it was superior than what we have today. Just take a shot. I mean, and you know, the the hypostyle hall. This is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, this thing is just absolutely off the chart huge. And Akhenaten, uh, w when Akhenaten built the, the Temple of Autumn here at Karnak, it had already been used for thousands of years before Akhenaten even came on the scene. This is so old. And like we said in the introduction, this is the largest religious temple ever built. You can throw the Vatican, uh, the Temple of Notre Dame, the, the Milan Cathedral. You can put it all in there and have room left over. We're talking about something on such a huge scale here that when we really begin to grasp uh, what this Temple of the Long Skulls was, it, it is just truly gigantic, to use a biblical word. Absolutely, David. And just to throw us out here, uh, Brother David, you know how everybody's talking about in the scientific community, talking about the speed of light. You've heard about the speed of light since we've been born into this world, right? Speed of light, speed of light, the academia world. Got one for you. It, it, the lost technologies of ancient Egypt here with Christopher Dunn. If you, if you, take, if you take the uh, coordinates in Egypt... That's this. It's literally the concord the coordinates of speed of light. Like you can type it in the number of the speed of light, and it'll directly take you to Giza. And you're talking about Karnak and all these different things, and the the Apache helicopter. How did they get the imagery there to uh, print it? You know, basically carve it into it. It almost looks 3D printed. It almost looks so precisely cut into these, in into this rock, right? And Karnak is a it's a comp the complexity of this place, the, pre the precision of the machines or whatever they used was off the, off into a different realm. But I wanted to bring that up. The speed of light it it will it will direct you to Egypt, and it's just it's very compelling. It absolutely is, absolutely. Now, let's take a good look here in this next slide. We referred to this earlier and showed you the relationship of the position here it was in the temple at Karnak. This is called the obelisk, and I'll try to say the lady's name correctly, Hat Shaputz, Hat Shaputzet or something, you know. I'm sorry, you know, I'm not the best on pronouncing words. It's H-A-T-S-H-E-P-S-U-T. Um, now, I'll read here. This is from The Magic of Obelisk by Peter Tompkins. Uh, this book and his book on the Great Pyramid are just really, really top notch. But he says here, this is on page 12 of this book. I'm going to go back to The Magic of Obelisk by Peter Tompkins. And I'll read here concerning the obelisk of Queen Hatshepsut. And it says here, the Karnak obelisk of Queen Hatshepsut first of the noble women, so named at the age of 13, after a mysterious ceremony. This queen is described as a sensuous, mystical creature who considered herself an incarnate goddess, born of theogamy, meaning that one of her parents was a god, divinely ordained to rule Egypt. She was depicted wearing the traditional artificial beard of a pharaoh and was referred to as he 
And this might have been right where we got cut off talking about the uh, androgynous God of America that we did on the midnight ride. And how I mean, it's just a fact. If you go back to the Sumerian exorcism text and the oldest of the Babylonian, it talks about the androgynous beings that were in the deep. Also, we have the androgynous uh, God concept in Gnosticism, in Kabbalah. And uh, this is here in Egypt, the the teaching here of uh, calling uh, Hatat's put he with the beard. Uh, you know, this is very much in line with what we see in Babylon and very much opposed to what we see in the word of God. Now, we'll go on here and we'll talk a little bit about Caligula. And this is really going to be quite a ride here, my friends. Uh, Caligula was the Roman emperor. They're just not adjectives enough to describe what a pervert this young man, th this man was. He had the original Orgy Island. Uh, he was very fond of young boys. And I mean, he was just an absolute pervert of the highest ilk. And Mr. Caligula moved the Lateran of Blisk from the temple of Karnak and brought it to Rome. And there's a lot of obelisk in Rome. And uh, there's even now more obelisk in Rome than there is in Egypt. But we see here the famous Vatican obelisk. And we see also the Lateran obelisk. And the Lateran obelisk is the one that was moved from the temple of Karnak and placed here in Rome. And where it was placed is very prophetic and very, very important to understand. And, you know, the people that did this stuff, I mean, they understood what they were doing. Caligula understood very well the dark side, and he was in it up to his little bitty eyeballs. Now, we're going to see where he took it. And he took it to the Circus of Nero. And in the Circus of Nero, as many uh, people know and understand, this was the place where Christians were martyred. They were martyred in the most horrific fashion. They were put in animal skins and uh, let the dogs just worry them until they died. I mean, it was horrific torture and the death of Christians. And this is where Caligula placed the obelisk of from Karnak, the Lateran obelisk, as it is called. And we have two drawings here to depict this. One is from 1699 showing this obelisk in the circles of Nero, and one from 1561, where we again, we see this placed um, in the circles here of Nero. So this is not coincidental that this is tied and connected to uh, the persecution of Christians. And far from being something that would uplift Christianity, this is something that absolutely uh, is against it. And we're going to be showing how the Lateran Cathedral was built right opposite of this Lateran obelisk. And we're going to be showing you uh, the significance of that. You now, Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Well, I was gonna no, add, please go right ahead. Well, I was going to the Latern Obelisk. We want. I wanted to point that out. I know we kind of got a little shaken a while ago. We got a little shaken, but we're not going to let the devil take us down tonight. We're going to keep going with this broadcast because it's so important. And me and Brother Dave was so stoked to do this program. So everybody, just push the live button. Uh, there's a lot of people in the chat saying there's some issues. Just push live. We are officially back and live for the last few minutes. Sorry for the inconvenience, folks. But let's get back in the broadcast here. So, Latern Obulist. I'm going to bring this up. So, who in the world in the Catholic area over there in the Vatican, why do we have two individual obelisks, but there's one that has same Egyptian, or as far as hieroglyphics, on the phallic, just like it was at Karnak? How does this happen, and how does the Vatican... In the the whole Catholic organization over there, how did they deem this Christ? 
That's just a question for me. How does this even... There's nothing to do. This has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. These these obelisks has nothing to do with Christ. The, the Egyptian the Egyptian language nothing like the the hieroglyphics that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ or, or the Son of God, and it just baffles me. They just put it on display, put a little cross on top of it, and sing you know Kumbaya and have a good day. So I just wanted to bring that up, David. It it is a circus. <laughs> it is. It is a circus, brother David. <laughs> yeah, it was a pagan reveling and a celebration. Uh, just like when during the Saturnalia in Rome, every Christian that died in the Saturnalia festivals in the arenas was considered uh, a human sacrifice to the god Saturn. And in this next book, we have a uh, a picture here, the cover of Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I believe every Christian should read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And Mr. Fox goes into great detail explaining the horrific details of the persecution in the Circus of Nero. And he told in detail how one of their favorite things was to take a Christian and to take them in the skin of an animal that had just been killed. And they would sew them up in it. And then they would throw them out and just let the dogs chewing them till they died. I mean, the, and Le Nero literally would uh, cover Christians in wax and set them on fire like human candles to give light for his parties and orgies. I mean, it's unbelievable, but this is very well detailed. And to understand the satanic um, level of evil we're talking about here, I mean, we're talking about the absolute persecution of believers by Satan himself. I was going to, there was several years ago, it's probably like 15 years ago, David, there was a, there was an evil movie that uh, was out, uh, came out in the theaters. Um, it was some type of, I don't know if it was a haunted movie. It was a horror movie, and to say it's in the least. They would cover people in wax, and they was literally basically sedated and covered in wax while they was, and then they wake up in, basically encapsulated into wax and yeah. some nefarious things. That's what it reminds me of when you just read from the book of martyrs there. Very bizarre. Yeah. They probably brought that. They probably got the inspiration from that probably more than likely. I didn't forget the name of the, of the, of the film, but yeah. And there was an old movie back in the fifties called house of wax with Vincent price. And uh, that had some of the same concepts and ideas in it. So yeah, this has been, uh, this idea has been around on the dark side for a long time. Now, we're going to take you inside the Lateran Cathedral and the Lateran Obelisk, which came from the Temple in Karnak. It was set up uh, right in the circles of Nero. And later, this Lateran Cathedral was built uh, right around it. And we've got some slides here that uh, Brian is going to show us the inside here of the Lateran Cathedral. And we're also going to show you the chair that the Pope sits on in the Lateran Cathedral. We, do you have that up there, Brian, that chair? I uh, sure can, Brother David. This Lateran Cathedral is interesting in itself, but we're, let's get on to the uh, Pope's chair. I, I like that this was, this is one of our favorite parts here. So, the Pope's chair is up, folks. Uh, there's an outer view of it, the dome and everything above it. But, Brother David, there's the floor back to you, my friend. It is up, my friend. Mm. All right. And this, you can just see the amazing, uh, we got the twin pillars. We have all kinds of hexagrams over the top of this. And there on the bottom of this throne chair is the basilisk. It is literally that uh, the ancient, uh, legend of the basilisk that this was such a demonic and we're talking about literally a demonic hybrid creature that this creature was so evil that if you even looked it in the eye that it would kill you so and the word uh, and the Romans Catholic Church and I don't even like to use the word church but the Roman Catholics they have their basilicas 
And the word basilica comes from the word basilisk. And this is where the Pope sits when he makes his de declarations ex cathedra, where he speaks with his papal authority on the throne here with the basilisk on the bottom. Yeah, let's put our throne on a, a, an emblem of an animal that represents Satan. Yeah, and then let's put it right across from this um obelisk that come from the temple of the long skulls in this very place where we had so many christians that were martyred and such horrific it was more than just martyrdom it was horrific torture so these things are not coincidental these things are just absolutely um beyond the pale of being circumstantial these are things that are their their deliberate plan the evil one and we're going to show some pictures here, and I just want to appeal to our Catholic friends here. I mean, I know some really nice Catholic people. I mean, they're nice. They live a, a, a good life. They're, they're good people. But please take a look. Brian is going to show you some pictures here, and we're going to speak to him. This is from the Pope's Auditorium. I mean, if the obelisk and if this uh, the Pope's throne with the basilisk isn't enough, please just look at this and just pray pray a prayer and just ask yourself, you know, you know, is this of God or is this of the devil? And we're going to be showing you some pictures here in uh, the Pope's auditorium where he speaks at. And my goodness, the first picture here, we're going to see Jesus depicted with an elongated skull uh just set that up for our listeners there brian so on the screen here folks we have this demonic background where the pope is sitting there on his i wouldn't say high pedestal but like brother david said that's supposed to be a depiction of jesus as you can tell there's like this demonic it's just demonic background and it looks like to me right out straight the gates of hell but the thing i want to point out like Brother David said, elongated skull. It looks more reptilian. There's an image of like a so-called man on there, but there's like a snake coming out of it. It's really strange, and it's just so wicked and demonic. You know, I've heard people's different interpretations of it saying, hey, it's like Jesus is coming. He, Jesus has the keys. They try to give excuses. Jesus has the keys to hell. So that's what the Catholics, that's what they was trying to represent in the uh, Vatican here. Um no, folks, that's totally wrong. <laughs> this, uh, and first of all, we shouldn't have an image of Jesus as it is. And then second off, this is not, this is like something out of a movie, Stranger Things, or some kind of demonic film. And the imagery that you see on the, on the screen here, I don't, when you're, like we mentioned earlier with the Samaritan, I think it was Mesopotamian, we was talking about the different uh, cultures with the different, the Karnak and the, the Retellian clay-like figures. This is nothing but straight up satanic there's nothing else to say about it it's straight up demonic and you can get it just take a good look at that and you can go do the search yourself and please catholic friends take a look at this i mean that is an elongated snake skull it is definitely a reptilian snake skull that's elongated and this is how they represent jesus but Satan is the one that has fathered through the fallen angels, these mighty men of old, and to them, their God is a reptilian. Their God is a reptilian. I mean, this is just too much. And if that isn't enough, just look at the auditorium. It's a snake face. I mean, it ain't, maybe it looks like a serpent. It absolutely is a serpent with the two eyes there it is just i mean you just can't miss this brian well unless when, you're trying to <laughs> well when you're looking at it and you're sitting in the audience right so earlier like we mentioned at the beginning of the program of karnak when you're walking up the sphinx the avenue of the sphinx you're looking at there's all this you know architect work that's been built by somebody that's not of a of a human nature and you have this on the screen here with this lovely snake head and the audience is participating in worship when they're worshiping the white throne gentleman. I hate to use that term, but he's got a white robe on. He's walking around, and his their perception is different than his perception. So wait, 
when I switch the slides here, you'll see that you got the two snake eyes there, and then you switch on down, and then that's what the crowd sees. That's what he sees. That's what the crowd sees with the Jesus interpretation of Jesus, the imagery and all the demonic stuff in the background there. So there's the snake is eating the people. It's almost like the devouring of the audience. That's the way yeah. I interpret it. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what it is. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, why they go, well, we just accidentally made our auditorium to look just like a snake eating the crowd. You know, I mean, you know, this is satanic. You know, we would just exhort our Catholic friends to renounce and repent of Catholicism and to get out of it quick as you can, because this is not of God. And I don't know any more obvious proof of that than right here. This is obviously the work of the dark one. No doubt about it. And it's coming back. I tell you what, it's coming back. It's here. And just like in the Circus of Nero, across from the Lateran Obelisk, where untold numbers of Christians were killed uh, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations and the persecution of the early believers that they suffered under Nero this will come back under the beast and there are two beasts in Revelation 13 and that second one that false prophet he one day will sit in the uh under Benini's canopy there in the Vatican and proclaim himself to be uh, this this final false prophet. We're going to see it, and I believe we're going to see it in the very near future. Everything is escalating at a high rate of speed, David, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the hijinks, I mean, we could um, spend untold hours uh, detailing the hijinks of this Jesuit Pope that they have. It's just, um, it, it is just terrific. So, you know, he that hath an ear, let him hear repent and come out of catholicism in jesus name right now jesus can save you and set you free from this uh beast system he absolutely can yeah and then also i agree with that 100 percent because you know i have to why it has to be some type of a divination there has to be spell binding casting of some shape or form brother david there has to be something here to put a spell on somebody um that would have such pull and power to have for somebody to pay homage to like 24 7 like to sit in these cathedrals sit in these places with this snake it, it is baffling my mind when you just you can obviously see it and they just sit there and they worship yeah. these people. Makes it just unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all we can do is show you the facts here and just pray in Jesus' name, come out. Come out in Jesus' name. Um, come out before it's everlastingly too late. Well, we talked earlier about the sacred lake at Karnak, and we're going to read from a book by Rosalie David called The Call to the Sun. And we're going to give uh, an explanation of this. And on the call to the sun, on page 100, it says, and this gets a little gross, and the whole thing is gross. The water was brought from the sacred lake of the temple, for Nile water was believed to possess magical properties. It was regarded as the body fluid of the god Osiris. The solar liturgy was the basis of all later rituals, but elements of the Osirian doctrine also permeated the rites. And here, both the essence of the sacred water and the two gods chosen to sprinkle the king, Horus and Thoth. So we have a magical working here. This is for the purpose we've showed uh, at Chicken Itza. We showed, and in the Kennedy assassination, we showed these sacred lakes, and it's there. You can see the reflecting pool in Washington, D.C. 
by the obelisks there. They are for magical workings. Mm -hmm. And by the Freemasons' own admission, the third degree of Freemasonry, the raising of Hiram Abeth by the Master Mason, this is based on the ritual of Osiris right here. And uh, it is a magical working. And as always, I think we can see that magic and science they blend together over and over and over. Now, you've shown this before, Brian, and just uh, take us back here in this next slide to this is called the Avenue of the Sphinxes. And this Avenue of the Sphinxes, Brian showed it to you in the big picture, and it there's gobs of them, and they connected the temple of Karnak and the temple of Luxor, which was just basically... In the same proximity there, the temple at Karnak and the temple at Luxor. And we want to show you this and get a good understanding of the Avenue of the Sphinx from Karnak to Luxor because we're going to show you a very important ritual that took place uh, regarding this Avenue of the Sphinxes. Well, one thing, too, I want to point out, too, David, the uh, you know the Luxor, wasn't there a parade and everything in 2020 and then something in 2021, a reopening of Luxor, right? Oh in, yeah, in that compa in that something in that intriguing, right? The the twenty twenty that I brought up that I was bringing yeah. up the counting of these uh, these sphinxes here on the the Avenue of the Sphinx. Isn't that, isn't that weird? I mean, it's kind of is it coincidence? I don't know. I don't believe in coincidences, but hey. I, and then they you know how they pulled all the supposedly they pulled the Ramses, all these priests out of the Grand Encaro and and opened them up and you know you did a parade and through Luxor and all that. So it's something to. It's something to document and put on the shelf there for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. And they made a huge deal out of it. They did. I mean, it mm -hmm. was a huge deal. Uh, and what you're seeing, and this was a reenactment. I'll read on page 151 here. Uh, this is also from the Call of the Sun. This was the Festival of Ophet. And this is what has been reinstituted in recent times. They spent millions of dollars on this. And I'll just read a little bit of the explanation, what it's all about and what they're really celebrating. It says, as the statue of the god was carried in his golden bark by the white robed priest, there would be clamor and shouting as the fervent worshipers pressed in on all sides and the procession would be accompanied by chanting and singing and dancing, a real hootie bob. The priest who preceded the bark would purify the God's way by wafting incense. And finally, the entourage would reach its destination. The God's statue would enter the temple where his divine wife awaited him. And outside the walls of the temple, the people would continue with other festivities for a period of 24 days. Wow. 24 <laughs> days. 24 days. There you go, folks. <laughs> At the end of each time, the god statue would be brought back again to Karnak. And this was brought up, and they would go in procession on the Avenue of the Sphinxes from uh, Karnak to Luxor. They would take this statue of the god from Karnak. It would go up the Nile River. And I mean, they did over the top on this it was a big 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 deal and what it is it's the reenactment of the sacred marriage well uh there uh the woman lays there they did the same thing in babylon the ritual of the sacred marriage it's recorded in uh, the golden bow and of course this is the genesis 6 scenario and um there you go it's plain as day the answer and the understanding to what these people are doing here it's not the ancient aliens my friends but it's right in the word of god and you can see them uh doing uh just exactly what the bible says in genesis 6 and throughout all the scripture yeah i agree david and to pull off this you know talking about the getting back on karnak and i have some more slides here with the the high uh, hypo uh, style hall. There's a another perspective. I took you all to Google Earth earlier and showed you all the height. And there's the people there standing in awe, right? And the obelisk is out there in the back end, the background of this portrait here. And it's just to pull this off. There had to be 
significantly sized, like Brother David just said. We've got the Genesis 6 narrative going on here. And there had to be some pretty good size, significant size beings of people or entities or whatever to pull this endeavor off. To have this type of architect work and to make people be in awe. That's what I was getting at a minute ago. When we're in a snake building, we see the snake eyes looking at us, but we're so, our glass is so foggy, we can't see our, our lenses, the veil has been pulled over our eyes basically. And we can't see that we're in intimate, like literally, we're in a day with dangerous, we're in danger. They're in spiritual danger. And they're just paying homage to somebody walking across the stage, right? And I bet you the same thing happened in, in Karnak days. People be like, oh, it's in awe, you know? And I just, in this day, I can't even, I, I can't even process how you can just worship a man that's in a white robe that denies Christ and said, forbade him. He said that Jesus died for nothing on the cross. That was in his own words. I think it was in 2016 or something like that. The yeah. gentleman said that. How can you follow when somebody says Christ died for nothing? That's in, that's in, that's blasphemy. That's the most, that's bizarre. It's denying the Holy Ghost. The, that's denying the Trinity. How are you even instilling power? That's the way I see it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is so sad. And, you know, once you know Jesus, it's hard to imagine why anyone wouldn't want to know him. But we know that most of the world does not know Jesus because they haven't heard the gospel. The, many people haven't heard the real gospel that Jesus did die for your sins, that we all are going to be judged one day as sinners for breaking God's law. And one day we will uh, face that judgment bar. And when we stand before the great white throne, and everybody will, you will be judged whether or not you have accepted Christ's death upon the cross as payment for your sin up. And right now, the answer to everything is Jesus Christ. Whatever problem you have, your answer is Jesus Christ. The answer to all the mysteries of these ancient megalithic structures the answers are in the word of God. It's not in ancient aliens. Jesus is your answer. And we invite anyone that doesn't know Jesus. If you've never prayed that prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Pray that prayer right now. Do not go to bed tonight without repenting of your sin, committing your life to Jesus and asking him to forgive your sins by virtue of his death upon the cross. You can have new birth, eternal life, and peace with God. And all of these laborious efforts of these tremendous structures the Nephilim built, it's all about trying to build a counterfeit relationship with God. And um, the ruins of these ancient temples will once again be echoed by the ruins of all these modern-day um, Nimrods and Akhenatans that are trying to dethrone the God of heaven and establish their own selves as God. They all will come under the judgment of God and be buried under the sands of time. Absolutely, David. You know, there's one more slide, right? One more yes, slide. Sir. I have a lot to talk about this slide, but I'm going to give the floor back to you. What do you think we about... Go ahead. Well, you just go ahead. You just go ahead and speak to it. Well, and then I'll put in my thoughts here as we wrap up. Well, go right, ahead, sir. Nefertiti, Nefertiti. Um, I have a lot of. Uh, I've looked and researched Nefertiti, and you can see as the slide there, um, the you know the left, it's her hat, and then that's what the resemblance of what her skull would look like inside the the cap that she's wearing. Did you know that Nefertiti had an obsession with blue? Yes, I did. She had yes. a, she had an obsession with blue, David. Yes, she did. So, um, you know, we, you mentioned it earlier about Epstein. You know, the old uh, old blue roof. Remember we talked about that yes, in sir. previous broadcasts? Yes. There's that blue symbolism, right? The Maui-Hawaii connection, the blue, the laser that come down and was doing all kinds of weird anomalies and nothing that was blue did not get touched if it had blue on it. 
And I thought that was interesting that Nefertiti would go out and build places with blue on it. You can't hardly yeah. find, even if back then there would have been an endeavor to pull off the architect work to be able to take the in, the minerals and the elements to be able to pull off. You know, she wanted to be paid homage to with the, the with the jewelry, this you know the uh, rings, the necklaces, everything, the bracelets, and it had Nefertiti's insignia on it, pretty much. And I just thought that was so compelling to know that she did. She did. She was completely obsessed with blue. And with the things coming out, you know, that's happened the last few years, and especially everything within a day with knowledge, that resonated in my mind. I was like, man, these powers that be, you know, like the Karnak, you know, they're they're resurrecting the Luxor, opening the bridges back and all this, and bringing back all the, the priests and the ancient pharaohs. And uh, Nefertiti, where's she at? Where's Nefertiti at, Brother David? And why, why is there so many weird... I guess conspiracies going on with these places that have blue roofs and what's the correlation with that? Is there anything? I don't know, but, uh, well, hmm. we had the, uh, the blue house in Evansville, mm -hmm. uh, that John and I, uh, talked about in the documentary and that we wrote about in our Egyptian Masonic satanic connection book. And there are all kinds of strange, uh, legends. And, you know, not all of uh, when you look at these Egyptian beliefs and the beliefs, the mysteries, it shows you what they believe. It doesn't show you the facts of reality, but it shows you some insight into the dark realm and what it does. And there's this very within the word itself, Rephaim, uh, down into the re word, it means to reanimate. And, you know, we have the H.P. Lovecraft uh, did the, the movie Reanimator, very dark stuff. Uh, he also wrote the Necronomicon, very, very dark side stuff. And the idea inherent of bringing back uh, these uh, entities, you know, and in the Boris Karloff movie, The Mummy, and of course, this woman finds out that she is actually uh, this ancient queen and is going to marry uh, the mummy that comes back. So, you know, you have all of these uh, motifs that go on. And for sure, we see in Nefertiti, she was not just a uh, a little figure. She was a huge figure, almost like a coal ruler with Akhenaten. And uh, she was definitely a goddess figure, no doubt about it. And she is on a plane uh, and a par with Semiramis or Isis or any of these ancient goddess figures. So she pretty much seals the deal and completes the picture of uh, the ancient Genesis 6 scenario that was uh, promulgated here at Karnak. Hmm. Yeah, well said. And it, and it I want to bring this up too, um, just to kind of go down a little bit of rabbit hole here. Uh, isn't it interesting that the where is her hair at right these you know I, I've, I've listened to different things i've read different things about nefertiti and it's interesting that you know in saudi arabia and they have the sophia um that has no hair right it's a robot and it's kind of interesting uh we could go down some really many different routes with that but um it makes me wonder what's really going on here and why is all you know did she have you know, hair, but does she have hair? You know, you see, like we began the program, we looking at the elongated skulls with the red hair and different depictions of that. And was she bald headed, David? I mean, well, I'll just give a little segue. Um, on our next broadcast of our cities lost in time, we're going to be exploring a theory that has been put forth and I think has a lot to um, say for itself that a lack of hair, now I'm not getting on bald people here, but that a lack of hair could be connected with the mark of Cain. And I'm just going to leave that there. That's something we're going to be exploring uh, in some, in our, next broadcast on cities lost in time so i think it could be very significant and uh the absence of hair 
uh, could definitely be a genetic trait from the fallen ones. Now, also in the Word of God, it says that uh, you're bald and you're clean, that being bald doesn't make you uh, unclean or shaving your head. You know, if somebody likes to present themselves that way, nothing wrong with that. But uh, I think it could have significance as a genetic Nephilim marker. Wow. That one was a good uh, plug-in for the next broadcast for the City's Lost good in Time. Good segue. So there you go. Yeah, good segue. Are. Yes, sir. Well, we're going to wrap up our broadcast for this evening, and uh, we are, uh, again, um, we apologize for the technical difficulties. Very frustrating. Very frustrating to have to deal with things like that. But, hey, whatever we got to deal with, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with it, get it done. And uh, we're, we're just thankful to be able to present this material to you. Uh, we just appreciate your prayers and all your help and sharing this video out because we have to work a little harder than uh, the, the rest of the folks to get the truth out. Uh, truth is definitely opposed, as you know, and we're doing everything we can on these uh, platforms to be able to get the truth out. So, Brian, any final words before we wrap this broadcast up? Well, like always, I'm just so blessed to be part of it, Brother David. And uh, City's Lost in Time, folks, uh, Karnak Temple of the Long Skulls, you know, there's a lot of deception out there. The academia world has uh, convinced us to believe so many different narratives. And I pray that me and David have uh, shown you all and presented the things that opens your mind up to understanding that, uh, you know, it's time to put our discernment meters on and, and not be um, bamboozled by some of these things has been taught throughout the years and i pray this has been a blessing to you all and um yeah christ is king you know and uh yes we, he we, is we amen need, we need to make sure that we stay on that so and stay on that route and that narrow path but yeah i can't wait to the next one brother david can't wait to the next city's lost in time well we won't have to wait too long and uh, we just want to say thanks a lot to all our chat folks that stuck in there with us praying for us uh, God bless you all. And we're just going to say until the next time we see you here on FOJC Radio, high five and good night from FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. God bless you all.